Afternoon, everybody. Michael, good to see you. Uh, a couple of quick notes before I uh, turn to your questions. <clears throat> Uh, first, a, a number of you have asked about reports of airstrikes in Idlib province, Syria, targeting al-Qaeda members. Now, I can confirm today that the United States conducted a series of precision airstrikes this week in northwestern Syria against al-Qaeda operatives, strikes that further weaken al-Qaeda's ability to threaten the United States. On Sunday, January 1st, U.S. forces struck two al-Qaeda vehicles that had departed a large headquarters near Sarmada, Syria. On Tuesday, January 3rd, U.S. forces struck the headquarters itself, targeting multiple vehicles and structures. Al-Qaeda's foreign terrorist fighter network used this headquarters as a gathering place, and their leaders directed terrorist operations out of this location. We continue to assess the results of these strikes, uh, but our initial assessment is that the January 1st strike killed five Al-Qaeda militants and destroyed two vehicles, and January 3rd strike killed more than 15 militants destroyed six vehicles and nine structures. Again, our assessment here is ongoing, but we are confident these strikes will degrade al-Qaeda's ability to direct operations in Syria and beyond. As you know, al-Qaeda remains committed to carrying out terrorist attacks against the United States, our interests, and our allies and friends. We will continue to take actions to deny any safe haven for al-Qaeda in Syria. and We will not allow al-Qaeda to grow its capacity to attack the United States or our allies around the world. And these strikes demonstrate that commitment. Second, I know you got a, an update yesterday from Colonel Dorian on progress in the counter-ISIL campaign. But even in the last 24 hours, we have again continued to see additional gains in both Iraq and Syria that I would like to detail uh, briefly, if I could. In the campaign to liberate Mosul, Iraqi security forces have made progress both in liberating new neighborhoods and in clearing areas already liberated. They have further linked the various axes of advance into Mosul which, as we've mentioned previously, makes the ISF's job easier and ISIL's job more difficult. Of course, the Global Coalition continues to support Iraqi forces with airstrikes, eight in the last 24 hours in support of the Mosul operations, as well as assistance from the ground. Meanwhile, in Syria, Syrian Democratic forces continue to liberate territory on the way to Raqqa. SDF forces have now advanced to within seven and a half kilometers of Tabqa Dam and continue to make progress in clearing areas north and west of Raqqa. And in support of these operations, the coalition in the last 24 hours conducted 10 airstrikes, including strikes against both tactical units and the oil infrastructure that provides ISIL's shrinking financial support. Uh, some operational deployments as well to update you on. Uh, starting today and including tomorrow, ships and units from the Carl Vinson Strike Group will depart San Diego for a regularly scheduled deployment to the Western Pacific. The Nimitz-class aircraft carrier USS Carl Vincent, Carrier Air Wing 2, and Embark Destroyer Squadron 1 will deploy with Ticonderoga-class guided missile cruiser USS Lake Champlain and Arleigh Burke-class guided missile destroyers USS Michael Murphy and USS Wayne E. Meyer. Homeport in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, Michael Murphy will join CVNSG later this month as the strike group makes its way to the Western Pacific. CVNSG will deploy with approximately 7,500 sailors and will focus on maritime security operations and theater security cooperation efforts. The strike group assets will conduct bilateral exercises in the Indo-Asia Pacific region to include anti-submarine warfare, maneuvering drills, gunnery exercises, and visit board search and seizure subject matter expert exchanges. And separately on the deployment front, the United States is demonstrating its continued commitment to collective security through a series of actions designed to reassure NATO allies and partners of America's dedication to enduring peace and stability in the region in light of the Russian intervention in Ukraine. Tanks, trucks, and other equipment are scheduled to arrive in Europe this weekend, beginning a nine-month rotation of U.S. Army forces supporting Operation Atlantic Resolve. The arrival of troops and equipment from 3rd Armor Brigade Combat Team, 4th Infantry Division out of Fort Carson, Colorado, marks the beginning of the continuous presence of an ABCT and back-to-back -back rotations of U.S. troops and equipment in Europe. After the equipment arrives at Bremerhaven, Germany, it will move by rail, commercial line haul, and military convoy to Poland. The personnel and equipment will later be relocated throughout the region for training and exercises with European allies. This effort is part of our European Reassurance Initiative to maintain persistent rotational presence of air, land, and sea forces in Central and Eastern Europe. And with that, I'd be happy to take your questions. Lita Baldor. Peter, can you um, bring us up to date a bit on the situation with Turkey 
Um, has the secretary had any discussions with his counterpart about the ongoing um, sort of rhetoric that's been going back and forth about whether or not um, there is an actual threat by the Turks to limit or close access to Interlik? And has there been an offer of additional aid, military aid, to Turkey? Where does that stand? Or have the Turks requested aid um, in some fashion for um, their fight in al -Bab, And is that being discussed? Can you just yeah. fill us in uh, on I, some of that? I will update you to the, to the extent I could, uh, Lita. But this is, you're quite honestly not going to hear much more than, than you heard yesterday from Colonel Dorian, because these are this is the focus of ongoing discussions between the United States and Turkey, um, our coalition uh, partner, our NATO ally. Uh, these are discussions, as you've heard from me and from Colonel Dorian as well, uh, both at the highest levels of our government as well as military to military channels. Uh, and this is an ongoing conversation. I'm not going to read out what those discussions are at, at this point, other than to say that we and Turkey both share the desire to. Uh, to defeat ISIL in Syria and elsewhere, and that this effort in Al Bab uh, is an important effort um, aimed at uh, at ISIL, and we're going to do uh, again continue our conversations and try and coordinate our activities so that we maintain the most pressure on ISIL, uh, not just in Syria but also in Iraq across the board. Has the secretary had any conversations with his counterpart? So I don't have any conversations to read out for you here. So you're not saying he hasn't. You're not. I don't have don't any conversations to, to read out here. We have, I just want to reaffirm to you, um, as I did the other day, that these are um, very active conversations, daily conversations, and that they are ongoing at this time. And can you say whether the U.S. is prepared to provide additional military support to Turkey? We're, absolutely, we're having this conversation to, to find out the best and most effective way uh, to support um, the broader ISIL campaign, including uh, in, in Al Bab. And we are having that conversation with Turkey about the best way to do that. And do you believe that the Turks will limit or restrict access to Insulik? Is that a credible threat at this moment? Uh, listen, we, uh, you heard uh, Colonel Dorian, uh, and you've heard me say how important Insulik is to our operations, uh, how much the coalition appreciates uh, access to, to Insulik as part of this campaign. And uh, we certainly uh, will continue to have our conversations with Turkey and make that point uh, clear. And uh, we will, uh, it's a valuable and important part of our operations, and we certainly uh, hope and expect that it will continue. Well, just a final follow up. I understand all that, but other than the public comments being made by some of the Turkish leaders, mm -hmm. has there been a direct conversation from the Turks to the U.S. saying that they? Um, want the U.S. to leave Interlake? Has there been any direct conversations other than what you've heard them say publicly? Listen, we continue to have our private conversations with the Turks. I'm not going to get into uh, all of our uh, discussions uh, with the Turks, but we are operating out of Interlake right now. We're, again, very appreciative of the access that we have to Interlake. The coalition has uh, to Interlake, and we uh, look forward to that continuing. Yes, Paul. Uh, Peter, to follow up on that, the Turkish president said yesterday, I believe, that <clears throat> they're anticipating being able to retake Al Bab shortly, and then after then they're going to focus on other towns, most notably Manbij, where he said where terrorists are resting. Are you aware of any other significant terrorist forces that are currently holed up in Manbij? The last we heard, that town had been liberated. Um, our assessment of, of Manbij has has not changed. That. ISIL has been defeated in Manbij, and uh, we think that's a, a good thing. That's a significant thing. There were significant uh, efforts made by the coalition and others to make that happen. Uh, and we believe the, the best focus right now is, again, to remain focused on ISIL wherever it may be. And the coalition's assessment right now is that ISIL is in other parts of, of Syria. So with this apparent pledge from the Turkish president, what concerns do you have that the Turkish armed forces might be going after the Kurdish forces that are currently in Manbij, securing it? Uh, again, our, the focus for the coalition for the United States remains on ISIL, and we think that should be the focus of the coalition. And then moving over to Iraq, uh, Colonel Dorian said yesterday there are about 450 coalition advisors now involved in the Mosul operation, including some who have gone into the city. Can you say at what level now U.S. advisors are embedded with headquarters of the conventional Iraqi units? I know 
The last we heard, I thought it was at the division level, but they had clearance to go farther down. Do you know how far down the chain of command? Um, I, I think we've talked about this uh, in the past, that there have been uh, separate from the Special Operations Forces, that the, uh, there is the capability, the authority to go down to the battalion level. Um, and there has been at least one instance in the past, specifically we talked about it, the uh, efforts with, uh, with an engineering unit that assisted with uh, bridging related to the movements around Kiara. Um, and uh, I'm not aware of it uh, extending beyond that at this point, uh, but I won't also can't rule it out. Uh, General Townsend has this authority to use as he sees fit, um, but I'm not aware that it's been extended, been used uh, beyond that. So is it safe to say then that the Americans who are advising the Iraqi forces in Mosul are with either CTS or the Pesh then? No, I, I think, again, uh, they're with headquarters elements uh, in, in most cases. The, the, with the conventional Iraqi forces, they're at uh, providing uh, advice and assistance at the division levels with the leadership. Um, and I, I can't tell you with, again, precision here, because I honestly don't know whether General Townsend has used that uh, uh, more recently uh, at a lower level. Uh, but again, the, there are some of those headquarters elements are moving as the forward line of troops moves that uh, certainly there are Iraqi uh, commanders who are closer to Mosul now than they were previously, and our folks are providing a, a advice and assistance to them. Likewise, though, I want, I want to make clear that not all these folks are specifically tied to, to Mosul. We have advisors right now, for example, in Baghdad. Uh, we have advisors uh, at uh, various locations, installations um, that may be supporting Mosul. I, I mentioned Kiara again, uh, Camp Swift. So uh, we have forces in a variety of positions, advisors in a variety of positions, um, not necessarily right uh, even on the outskirts of, of Mosul. So I just, it's a, that's a countrywide figure that I believe Colonel Dorian referred to. So, uh, yes, Barbara. Can I um, go back to the carrier announcement that yeah. you made for a minute? So, you know, uh, the Defense Department, the Navy, always likes to talk about aircraft carriers as a symbol of, of U.S. military presence in the far corners of the world. But it's been days, if not weeks now, since you have had a carrier either uh, deployed in the western, far western Pacific vis-a-vis um, -vis the Korean Peninsula or in the Persian Gulf. So in both cases, starting with the presence to counter North Korea, while you have other assets, what should people take away from the fact that the Navy does, has not had a deployable carrier for weeks in the two acknowledged hotspots, the Persian Gulf and off Korea? Uh, again, the deployment of the Carl Vinson is a, is a routine deployment, and Barbara, as you know uh, very well, we have uh, significant capabilities within the U.S. military. The Navy has significant capabilities. Uh, they are not all limited to aircraft carriers, and so those deployments are determined based on, again, operational needs, operational requirements, and we make adjustments uh, accordingly. And uh, we have had a significant presence in both those areas, and we'll continue to have a significant presence, even though we may not at any one particular time have an aircraft carrier there. But is it not somewhat interesting to you that there has not been an aircraft carrier off the Korean Peninsula or in the Persian Gulf for many days, if not weeks? Until you asked the question, it had not uh, piqued my interest. Uh, so, uh, again, Barbara, we have significant capabilities. We've walked through uh, some of what we do on a daily basis with regard to the threat from North Korea. Uh, we've talked about not only our presence of U.S. forces on the Korean Peninsula, but the substantial uh, uh, military capabilities that we have in the Asia-Pacific region. Um, some of those capabilities very clearly associated with the threat posed by North Korea, and we're confident in those capabilities. And if I could just ask one last thing on, on North Korea. Um, I mean, the world acknowledges there's been a certain level of rhetoric from Kim Jong-un mm -hmm. since the new year, and he made his public statements about wanting to launch an ICBM. Have you, are you able to say, understanding that you don't want to talk about intelligence, nonetheless, what can you say? Have you seen any signs of movement inside North Korea of their military capability or leadership that concern you? And do you find that since 
the new year when he made his statement and other statements were made inside the United States that you want to watch North Korea any more closely than you already do? Barbara, we watch North Korea closely every single day uh, for understandable reasons. Uh, and I'm not going to get into intelligence matters here. Uh, and I'm just going to say that we, our forces remain ready, as the slogan goes, to fight tonight in South Korea uh, along, that, along the border. Uh, we remain uh, vigilant in terms of watching the actions uh, of the North Koreans and, obviously, the, the rhetoric that we hear from, from North Korea. And we will continue to do so. And uh, today is uh, no different than yesterday, and tomorrow will be the same. Yes. Journalist, I welcome. Uh, thank you. I would like to ask you about Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Afghan people, they are concerned about their futures, especially after the, the situation that President Obama <coughs> leave uh, his position. What do you think? Uh, uh, U.S. Uh, 15 years involvement in Afghanistan. Do you think that U.S. successful in Afghanistan and U.S. was successful in Afghanistan during this 15 years? And also the second question that uh, recently Russia get connection with the Taliban. Uh, that's why it's a big uh, question mark for Afghan people that why Russia, uh, you know, start to have relationship with the Taliban. So uh, the, I'll start with the second one and I'll leave it to the Russians to uh, describe why it is they might be having uh, relations with, with the Taliban and how that's productive for the people of Afghanistan. I'll leave that to the Russians. Uh, but uh, more broadly on the question of U.S., uh, the military presence in, in Afghanistan, uh, we continue to have uh, a military presence there, as you know. We continue to provide support to the Afghan government, to the Afghan armed forces, so that they can uh, take uh, secure the country for themselves. They continue to make progress in those efforts. Uh, our folks, I know, General Nicholson and his team continue to work very closely with uh, the government, with the armed forces of, of Afghanistan uh, in terms of that effort. We have a separate CT mission, counterterrorism mission in Afghanistan that is also ongoing, critically important to the United States in keeping the homeland safe. That remains uh, very active. Uh, and we feel uh, good about the situation right now in Afghanistan with regard to the support we're providing, along with uh, other uh, members of the NATO coalition uh, in terms of bolstering the Afghan security forces, improving their uh, fighting capabilities on their own so that ultimately they can secure the country on their own. We see progress there. Afghanistan remains a very dangerous place. Challenges remain. I think you've heard President Ghani speak to that uh, 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 recently. And uh, we will continue to provide this kind of support we can uh, to bolster the Afghan security forces. Uh, and that uh, is an important mission and one that, uh, again, we're joined by other international partners in that effort. Yes. I have a question about Sinjar Mountain. Um, mm -hmm. There's a significant amount of PKK fighters uh, on that mountain. Prime Minister Abadi and KRG officials have asked the PKK to leave the mountain and go back to their places. What is, what is the U.S. position on that? Do you think they are helping on securing the area from ISIS infiltration? or? What is, what is your position on that? Uh, I think, I mean, Prime Minister Abadi, we, uh, Iraq is a sovereign government. Prime Minister Abadi uh, speaks on behalf of the Iraqi government and the PKK, as you know, is a terrorist organization uh, designated by the United States. And uh, we're supportive of what President Abadi has said on this front uh, and uh, remains a, a concern, of course. Uh, again, Iraq is a sovereign government. The Prime Minister has spoken on this issue and we're supportive of what Prime Minister Abadi's had to say. Carla. Um, thanks, Peter. But going back to what Lita and Paul were talking about, you, you said that the focus of the coalition is on the Islamic State, and we believe that should be the focus. But what is the consequence if that's no longer the focus? Have you been talking with your allies about the consequences should they not focus on Islamic State? And then also, can you follow up to talk about Turkey's role? I know Turkey wants to have a, a role in the fight for Raqqa. And the U.S. has been saying that this is a part of ongoing negotiations. Where is the U.S. and Turkey on that? Again, Carla, we, we're talking every day with our uh, Turkish ally about these issues. And uh, these are important issues. Uh, 
Uh, Turkey has significant concerns given uh, the threat ISIL poses to Turkey. We've seen ISIL's own claims of responsibility for this most recent nightclub shooting. Uh, and uh, we share Turkey's interest in defeating ISIL, delivering ISIL a lasting defeat. And we think there's important progress that still needs to be made on that, in that effort, and that Turkey can be a key player and is a key player in that, has a significant interest in that. The United States, the rest of the coalition have a significant interest. So we want to remain coordinated in that effort. We want to maintain pressure on as many fronts as possible, particularly at this moment in time when ISIL finds itself under uh, assault both uh, in Syria and in uh, Iraq and Mosul specifically and around Raqqa specifically. We think there's an opportunity here to accelerate this campaign even further, to put even more pressure on ISIL, and that remains the focus. All of our efforts are intended to accelerate this campaign against ISIL to keep the most pressure possible on ISIL, and that's the conversation we're having, not just with Turkey, but with all, our, all of our coalition partners. Can you confirm that they will take some sort of role in the operation to take Raqqa? Uh, again, the, that conversation is ongoing. Uh, I'll let the Turkish government speak for itself. Um, but certainly, we're talking to all of our coalition partners about uh, the next steps in the campaign, the most efficient and effective way to do that. And again, speed matters here. We want to move quickly. We've got ISIL under pressure right now, and we want to keep it that way. We want to accelerate, turn up that pressure if we can. Would you say that the most effective way to move forward is to go into cities that have already been um, removed uh, from Islamic State control? I, I think I spoke to that previously. We think we should go after ISIL where ISIL is. Otto. Peter, uh, you, Dr. Vincent uh, Battle Group, you, you cited uh, Vincent's plans to go to, in the Western Pacific, Indo Asia area, but there's still no plan to put a carrier back into the Gulf uh, to support uh, you know, Afghanistan, Iraq, and, and, and Syria. Uh, is there any possibility that Vincent will uh, be moved into the Gulf uh, after its stint, for initial stint in the Western Pacific? Uh, I'm not going to get ahead of uh, deployments. We've announced where the Vincent's going, the Navy did, uh, and uh, so I, I don't want to predict the future as to what the future operational the deployments will be. We are constantly assessing the operational requirements, uh, but we feel confident we have the resources we need uh, right now with regard to, to that part of the world and, and specifically with regard to the counter ISIL campaign. All done? In the back, yes. Uh, Peter, do you have any update on the engine that fell off of a B-52 uh, uh, yesterday? And whether or not people should be concerned about parts falling off of military aircraft that are 50 plus years old? Yeah, uh, I don't have a specific update on that. I would refer you to the to the Air Force if they've got any more details or specifically to, to mine it about what happened in that incident. Obviously, it's a concern and uh, something that we'll want to investigate fully. Um, but I don't have a specific update for you. Okay. Thanks, everyone.